Jake, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so let's start where we always start, and uh, let's hear some hear some of your backstory on how you got into beekeeping. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, I was born into it, although my dad wasn't a full-time beekeeper working for himself. He was working for another beekeeper, um, and... He's had his own operation on the side. Started out, you know, small, probably 25, 30 hives, and then kept building up. And then by the time I was old enough to work, I was helping extract, and I'd always help out once in a while bottling honey, or my dad would take me to the yards just to have an extra hand. Um, but yeah, I got sucked into working bees. I might have had a choice, <laughs> um, but extract and honey mostly through middle school summers. So you could have been a poet. Uh, yeah, I still could be if I <laughs> gave up all these lofty dreams of beekeeping. Put <laughs> your mind to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I started off mostly just doing the extracting, helping in the bees once in a while. But in high school, once I was you know a little stronger. I started helping do other just hive management, spring, summer, fall, but still my main job was helping extract. Or once I got to my later years of high school, I started helping rob the honey or harvest the honey. Um, and yeah, that kept me pretty busy outside of school. And then... And this is in Montana? This is in, yeah, in Missoula. We lived in Missoula. Bill's operation is based in Missoula. The warehouse is in Missoula. Bill is? Bill is the beekeeper that my dad um, was working for and with um, after Bill bought out his dad and uncle, who my dad was already working for. So my... Bill's a little bit younger than my dad. So my dad was already working for Bill's father and uncle. And when Bill started taking over, um, my dad had kind of become like the main guy, their main employee. Um, almost year round. They didn't do much in the winter. They didn't do pollination. Um, they just built boxes, paired stuff, built frames in the winter. So yeah, Bill's family, you know, beekeeping family is kind of like my beekeeping family in a way. Um, my dad, you know, learned everything he knew basically from Bill's dad and uncle. By the time I was extracting, Bill's dad had retired. Um, and actually, Bill's uncle had retired, but he was still helping extract. So I actually got to work with him extracting. He was in his late 60s, early 70s. Um, and so, yeah, I got the pleasure of working with him because he was a really genuine person and a sweet man and um, kind of like a grandpa figure after a while. Um, so working summers... In high school, I, you know, was robbing honey, started helping, you know, in the bees, and um, went to school in Wisconsin freshman year, uh, came back at the beginning of second semester to transfer to the U University of Montana, and that's really when I started being a bigger part of my dad's operation and and bills in a way i would work whenever i can when school wasn't in session whenever they needed me and um i started learning more about the hands-on management of hives in the field and my dad um ended up selling me and the other main employee at the time um 25 hives each and that was so we could make extra money because the hourly pay wasn't great. Um, 
So before you go on, what is what is life like for a commercial beekeeping worker? Do you get a salary? Do you work hourly? Do they just pay you when you need you, or do they pay you a salary and work you when you need you? Like, how does that all work? Yeah, for me, I mean, there's there's commercial beekeepers who have workers or managers who get salary, but I've always been hourly. I've never got a salary. Um, and so, yeah, it was just whenever the work was, got a, you know, I don't know what I started out, $8 an hour back then, worked my way up to 10 whatever, as, you know, wages were increasing back then. Um, yeah, don't make a whole lot of money. My dad and the beekeepers who own their bees, you know, they don't have a salary either. They don't have an hourly wage. They are living off of honey sales and pollination if they do that. Bill never did much pollination. Um, so their Is there income... Is reason why he didn't do pollination? His father told him, don't get involved with the almond pollination in California. Or I'm pretty sure that's what he said. It's a bad deal. He kind of foresaw the problems that were going to happen to bees, and and Bill took it to heart. Although when my dad started doing almond pollination, he started flaunting the check in Bill's face. It's a pretty good check. It's a pretty big check, and it, you get it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I don't know if my dad convinced Bill, or if Bill just decided on his own, but Bill... Maybe it's because he had a bad honey crop or something. He would pick out 420 or so strong hives and just send one truckload. So you can fit 420 on one truck? Yeah. Um, give or take a few, depending on the size of the truck and the weight of the hives. So does, is that a, like a fully loaded... Semi-flatbed. Like, right up to 80,000 80, pound gross truck? Yeah. So the, the, I guess the question I'm asking is, is the limiting factor the weight or the number of hives you can fit in the space? Um, usually the amount of hives you can fit in the space, but when they're heavy, the weight is the factor. Okay. But it, you're, it's usually, you know, it's once, right there. yeah, it's usually right there. Um, There's a lot of people doing this, so it's pretty much the same every time. Yeah. Um, so obviously if you have eight frame equipment, you can get quite a few more hives on the truck. So for whatever reason, Bill decided to send a truckload, maybe just so he could retire earlier. Um, and um, yeah, so when Bill started doing pollination, man, that was probably early 2000s. And that's about, and my dad started maybe two or three years before that. Um, and yeah, my dad was out sending every single one of his hives, overwintering zero. Um, and you mean they're going down there before winter and being stored somewhere? No, they're, well, they're going there before winter, yes. Um, they're not really stored anywhere, they're just set in a stockpile usually at the orchard or nearby orchard. So I've seen driving up I-5 in, in December and January, you'll see these big Stock groups piles. of hives. Yeah. yeah, just sitting out in a field. And they'll, be like, they'll be in like a giant circle. It'll be like three big circles. Is it like each one of those is a truckload? Usually, yeah. That's what I figured. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so he's been doing that every year since and he'll probably do it every year until he has no bees. Is that going to happen sooner or later? <laughs> um, I don't know. He is 62 and he's thinking about retiring so um, kind of depends on what he wants to do. He's got he's 62 and he wants to go another 10 years um, maybe he'll only go another five, but it's hard to say. He's kind of a 
tough old stubborn guy. Mm-hmm. So is Bill. But Bill's going to retire earlier. Even though he didn't do as much almond pollination, he was very good about saving money and paying off his debt. And so the other thing I should mention here is Bill, when he bought out his dad and uncle, they were running anywhere from 2,000 to 2,200 hives. And Bill wanted to sell the whole thing, the whole operation. And my dad, he was going to sell it to another beekeeper. And my dad was upset that he wasn't going to be able to buy any of the hives after working all these years for Bill's dad and uncle and then Bill. Um, So he convinced Bill to sell him some hives, some of the hives, sell the other beekeeper some of the hives, and Bill kept about 1,200. And my dad, with the amount of hives that Bill sold him um, and the amount of hives he had, got up to about 1,200. So Bill and my dad kind of became informal business partners where my dad would um, buy or rent half the warehouse and then they would share the space, share equipment, labor, feed bills, medication bills, kind of like 50-50 down the middle. Mm -hmm. And it was a good deal for a while. Um, uh, And so... That was really nice when Bill sold because there was less hives of Bill's to run and there's just less hives total to run because um, with my dad 600 and Bill's 2200 is like almost running 3,000 colonies. So we actually started getting days off in the summer, like Saturday or Sundays we started getting off <laughs> for extraction season. and. That was a big deal <laughs> for me anyway. Big deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that was pretty much the deal until now um, in terms of the work situation and who I was working for. I was working mostly for my dad, but once harvest season came, I worked about 50-50 between dad and Bill. And I would help Bill in the other parts of the season, but... So you're still working full time as a commercial beekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still, even even with my own bees and even with my brother's hives and and even when we're running the business together, it still was a small fraction of the. Yeah. So talk about that. Yeah. You're wearing a Whistler Brothers. Yeah. So. Hat. Yeah. After I got done messing around or screwing off as my dad likes to say at college <laughs> oh i didn't ask you earlier what was your degree or, or yeah your majors yeah so um when i left north on the first year and enrolled in the university of montana i was undecided and then the beginning of my sophomore year i enrolled into the music program so i did a full year of music um study you know all the courses i'd take to become a music major and then after that year i decided i wasn't really excited about being a professional classical musician and um what instrument i played viola okay and then i also played guitar yeah i saw you playing michael bush's guitar um so i still love music but anyway decided to go back to northland college uh, decided to uh, major in environmental studies okay. with an emphasis in public policy. So I did that, finished, took my time, my sweet time, finished basically in 2007. I needed one more course to graduate, so I didn't stick around to take one more course at Northland. I just came back home took the course at University of Montana, transferred the credit and got my degree. And um, at that point, I was working, after I moved back, I was working for Dad and Bill. Uh, I had a few of my own hives from the original 25 I had bought and I decided to get more hives. And since I was already working for my dad, 
might as well just start a beekeeping business. Granted, there is a different factor in here and why I went into the bees. I graduated technically in 2008 with a degree in environmental studies and public policy. Basically anyone with that degree that year lost their job. <laughs> so that was 2008. Economic crash. Economic crash. Anything that had to do with really save the environment stuff lost their funding and if you still had your job you were lucky so basically I was in a, a job market that was flooded with people way more qualified than I mm -hmm. with just very few jobs available and you know I entertained the idea of working for different companies but there just really wasn't anything that I wanted to do That's with that been degree. That's where I've been for the past couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, it's like, well, I'm already working for my dad. Um, sold my honey at the farmer's market. Realized there was quite a bit of demand and convinced my brother to start a business with me and get some hives. And then 2011, we started Wussner Brothers Honey. Applied for a grant through the State Department of Agriculture received $10,000 to basically start up our business and we put it all basically towards buying equipment and how much equipment does that get you uh it basically got us enough equipment for 100 or maybe 200 hives without honey supers maybe 100 hives with plenty of honey supers um roughly that's, you know, with lids. Uh, we didn't buy any bottom boards or pallets. We just already had pallets, but lids, foundation frames, boxes. Um, I think that's what we spent it all on. I can't remember the exact numbers, but uh, that was amazing because it gave us a lot of equipment to work with. The downside about it, or downside of it is, is all undrawn and it took um, took a long time to get that stuff drawn actually two years later after doing Worcester Brothers Honey with my brother um, I was trying to go treatment free I had kind of fallen onto the bandwagon of treatment free and it was causing a lot of tension between my brother and I because my brother has the better um, business sense than I do. So how did you, how did you come to to that position? Um, boy, basically, you know, reading stuff over, you know, what course your, of my. What were your big sources? First, it was whatever I could find on D. Lusby, mostly Michael Bush's stuff on his website. And then I was also getting really into permaculture and then at the same time. And um, I was going to these lectures that Paul Wheaton was putting on for free at the public library and kind of reinvigorated my passion for permaculture. Started, you know, getting, you know, more information about treatment-free beekeeping. Um, found Jacqueline Fried, Friedman was on one of Paul Wheaton's podcasts talking about honeybees and she mentioned the Yahoo Organic Beekeepers group and I pretty much after I heard her talk about that I was like I should sign up for that I'm calling myself an organic beekeeper I should be a part of this list of course when I was calling myself an organic beekeeper I meant I'm using organic treatments mm -hmm. um, so started reading all the emails and I wasn't totally sold on this small cell theory although I had wanted to try it I actually in that original grant money got some 4.9 wax foundation to try out but I didn't end up using it until 2013 and 14 but anyway so that Yahoo group was probably where I got most of my information at first and then um, you know the permaculture forum 
forms weren't very um, they were very muddled with lots of theory and lots of ideas and not many practical people doing research and supporting their their methods with data so basically I went to B-Source I read D. Lesby's book and I and I recognized through her writing that not only was she actually a real beekeeper um, she knew what she was talking about and there's a lot more theory behind the small cell um, than I had been exposed to before. What was your your ID on B-Source? My ID? Yeah, oh, I, I wasn't... Oh, just reading. I was just reading the okay. point of view. I was just reading D, D's book online. Did you ever come across any of my stuff? I don't know. No, I was... I was kind of flamed out over there, I think, by that point. Yeah, this was 2012, 11, 12, 13, really when I started digging more into the small cell stuff and treatment-free. And yeah, so at that point I was convinced not only was it possible that other people were doing it besides D, you know, Michael Bush, um, heard of other people doing it. Maybe I had heard of you at that point. Um, but convinced I wanted to try it at least. And um, really wanted to just start not start the process of letting hives die. Um, I didn't have any small cell hives. We had done previous in the previous years, five years of the breeding Marla Spivex hygienic breeding program so I felt and most of my 80 to 90 colonies were from those queens um, two or three years old you know I just now realize how odd it must sound to people when you say something like I wanted to start letting them die <laughs> I mean that's really the truth of the right. matter yeah but it's just so weird <laughs> <laughs> It's counterintuitive. It's like, what? A bit. You want to, you want what? <laughs> yeah. So I convinced my brother when we were still in business together to overwinter half our colonies or something. Or maybe it was all of our colonies. I, I can't remember. But either way, of the ones we overwintered, we lost over 50%. Um, and, you know, because we didn't treat for mites. And. So my brother was like, you know, I think this is a great idea what you want to try to do, but I don't want to but put gonna, my livelihood on the line. It's going to cost us too much money. It's, yeah, basically. We can't like, afford to be doing this. We're too poor to do this. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> yeah. Um, which was really true. So I decided after a lot of internal you know, strife and debate and trying to figure out what what am I going to do to pursue what I want to do and keep, you know, keep my family relationships on a good, you know, on a good note. So I convinced my brother to split up the beekeeping operation, which is really easy to do because I told him we'd split the hives 50-50 and he'd keep all the honey accounts. Ouch. But but that was the only realistic thing to do if I was going to let all my hives die. Otherwise... Otherwise you're taking him down with uh, you. <laughs> basically. And at that point... Let me off of this ship. <laughs> at that point, we were making enough money from our business for one person to make a living. Hmm. Not two. So when I did that, I you know, gave him the opportunity to really... Um, take Wissner Brothers Honey and make a successful business out of it without having to let your livestock die. So he kept the company name? Yeah. Yeah. So it's still Wissner Brothers? It's still Wissner Brothers Honey. He didn't want to change just it. One brother. Yes and no. <laughs> we have Now we have two separate companies. Legally, financially, they're separate. Hmm. But we still work together. And I still wholesale most of my honey to him. Okay. So it really is both of our honey, honeys, 
ending up in the jar under the Wussner Brothers label. Mm. And although I do have my own label and I do some retail um, and wholesale, I'm not trying to compete with my brother. I actually try to avoid um, seeking out any markets in his in his market mm -hmm. because well there's already enough competition he's my brother I want us both to succeed and from my point of view there's so much room for us to expand in the mar honey market that there's no sense that we would ever have to compete and yeah until we're the last two beekeepers on the earth basically partly because we have a better product and um, napweed honey is highly sought after. Oh, I tried that napweed honey, you guys, today. <laughs> oh, it is top shelf. <laughs> it is the some of the best honey, if not the best honey that I've ever tasted. It is absolutely delicious. I was grow growing up. I was told it's the best honey in the world, and that's obviously an opinion. But I hear from lots of people. You know, it's like, I've tasted honey all over the world, and it's, it's one of the best, you know. The, it's, to me, it's a tie between the nice, clear um, black locust honey that I would get in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. It's a tie between those two. It's, For sure, yeah. It's, it's, it's just so smooth, and yeah. you know, there's, no, there's no tartness or bite it's to it. It's not offensive. It's just, you just want to, you just want to eat it. <laughs> yeah. So it's very marketable. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've got that going for us. And it's like white. Yeah. It's white. So it's, you know, some people like white honey. Some people like dark honey. Some people like all honey. Like when it's crystallized, it looks like. Yeah. It looks like. Shortening. It's white. Yeah. It's solid white. Yeah. It's um, very clear, water white. Uh, honey and th and then the flavor is distinct now that honey you tasted there might be some fireweed in it which is also a very nice honey um, but it's mostly napweed and uh, once people get hooked on it they I mean they become customers for life usually especially if it's in your area um, there's none in my area unfortunately yeah or yeah not enough yet plants <laughs> I've seen the plant growing all over, but not in, you know, the density that yeah, you see it. Yeah, I don't even it. know what you're talking about. Napweed. Yeah. Well, there's a couple, few types. Mm -hmm. um, Russian, spotted, diffuse. Anyway, getting back to whatever I was talking about, the napweed honey is, I have always felt, was our key to success in business. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, we were doing unheated, unfiltered honey. Mm -hmm. We were only using... Oh, yeah. The honey I tried was definitely unfiltered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was just joking around. I picked up a jar and like, oh, look, it comes with bee parts. <laughs> yep. You might get a bee leg. <laughs> and we don't put them in intentionally. <laughs> um, but, yeah. You know it's got the good stuff <laughs> yeah. when there's a bee head in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that set us up to kind of expand a, a market that was almost non-existent when we lived. There was no one doing raw honey. No one. When we started. It's Not in, on a commercial scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started selling at the farmers markets and you know first couple of years were slow but after that you know it kind of took off. Anyway so that brings us back to when I split off from my brother. I started Sapphire Permaculture Apiary. A couple years later, I changed the name to Sapphire Apiaries because it's less of a mouthful and no one knows what permaculture is and mm -hmm. it just confuses people. It's like how vegans aren't calling themselves vegans anymore. What are they calling themselves? Plant-based. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just noticed that this past couple of months. Everybody says they're on a plant-based diet. Nobody's talking about vegan diet anymore. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, when I started Sapphire Permaculture Apiary, I started letting them die. 
And I had all those supposedly hygienic bees from the Marla Spivak program. I figured, well, I have a better chance of them surviving because we selected for hygienic behavior. Now well, we get into the depressing part of the and story. And then <laughs> they all died. <laughs> they didn't all die immediately. After the first year of not treating, actually most of them made it to the second year. And then they did really well in the spring. And then they started kind of floundering um, midsummer, where we're usually starting to get the napweed honey. And then before fall even hit, they were all dead. And it looked like they all died from mites. There wasn't any evidence of foul brood. Um, and so, yeah. It's kind of like a little thistle. Napweed looks like a little mini thistle. Yep. Yep, that's it. And uh, so I'll post a picture of this on... Uh, I'll probably just post a picture of the napweed instead of... For the podcast. For the logo for the podcast sure. so you can see that. But for those of you watching on the camera, I'll show you a picture right here. It, kinda, it, it does look like a little purple thistle. Yeah, but it's not it's not spiny like thistle, mm -hmm. but it will scratch your legs up when you walk through it. And there, and apparently that's a good enough reason to eradicate it. Um, so I let them all die. That same year that I stopped treating, I got 20 weaver queens and made nooks and put those queens in those nooks. and. Those were the only hives that survived no treatment for, um, after that point. And, but they didn't do well. Uh, Texas bees, they, dw they dwindled greatly over you winter. You run into the acclimation problems. And, um, but there were, after, after the first winter, there's about 12 decent hives that survived most of that next year. And after that, it was down to eight. After that, it was down to five, and then after that, I was down to one. So, so are you splitting these at all? Or? I made, okay, so the second year, 2014, I made five or six splits. Um, one one walkaway split, and then f four or five, um, like, takeaway, like, I split them and moved the bees to another location, so I retained the foragers. Fortunately, I moved them to my brand new location up Rock Creek, which is 60 some miles from my house. And I didn't go back till two weeks later and I had them on full open entrance bottom boards. And so when I came back, there weren't bees flying in and out. There was yellow jackets and wasps flying in and out. So big mistake, another big mistake. And you know, it, had the yellow jackets not been so bad at that time of year, that year, I might have got away with those hives surviving. But they were also all on 5.4 comb, and I was also seeing quite a few mites, not like a crazy number that I, you know, thought I had to treat. I also thought I saw spotty brood and some dying brood that might have been um, early stages of foul brood, but I still didn't do anything. And he, and after I would see that in like an inspection in the fall, or even in the spring, they would event it would eventually clear up. They would they would take care of the mites usually, and they they cleared up any foul brood if they had had got it. I never tested it, um, or even inspected very close. For my treatment free hives. I had a different um, management style too. It was more based on um, a hands-on approach, but just like ignoring ignoring the mites or ignoring um, brood diseases and just assuming they're going to come out on the other side. And I didn't want to dig in them too much. I didn't want to mess with them too much. I figured I was doing more damage than good but since they were hardier stock mm -hmm. um, so lost all the um, m all the other colonies and I would make them up every year out of my dad's bees and my dad uses California Italians mostly 
And um, so the genetics, you know, and, and the queen breeders he's buying the queens from, and he are, you know, treating twice a year at least. So they, you know, there's no reason to believe they had any um, mite resistance other than the fact that we tried to introduce some of our queens into our stock through the Marla Spivak program. But at that point, my dad had given it up and we didn't really have many of those anyway. And he ended up treating all those anyway. So. Well, yeah, they're, they're ultimately not treatment free. Yeah, right? they're not. And Even Marla says that. Yeah. So. I was making nooks out of his hives, but I wasn't introducing queens. I was letting them raise all their owns and hoping that by doing so, um, my bees were mating with drones of better genetics. But apparently they were not because even like the following three years, I did the same thing, making hives. I never got any more weaver queens. Um, we had gotten Weaver Queens before 2013, but they didn't do very well and, you know, they just either got killed, kicked out, or just got mixed in to the rest of the hives and not, you know, kept track of. So I didn't try to increase my, you know, treatment-free Weaver, Weaver Queen colonies other than making splits, which failed the first few years and then by that or the first couple years and by then I was down to so few I just made like a couple nooks out of each one and then I would I would take my my uh, nooks I made out of my dad's bees that were raising their own and I would try to mate them with the drones from the weaver colonies and it seemed like there was some um, crossbreeding hybrid between those two be two stocks. Um, during this time, you're trying to use small cell also. During this time, during 2013, I started doing foundationless frames. Mm -hmm. And I did one high, I did the shakedown. Didn't work. The, found, or the shakedown didn't work. The, the foundationless frames were still drawing 5.4 foundationless. Mm -hmm. um, so basically 2014 I might have introduced some more um, small cell combs but just one at a time or a couple at a time uh, and they never drew them out very well and I bought some 5.1 but I didn't get it really introduced to the following year um, once I started putting 5.1 in um, you know, they st most of them still didn't draw that properly. Um, probably partly because of the honey flow. Um, maybe because it was, you know, 0.3 is a big step. But I did see a lot drawn 5.2 and then occasional 5.1. And then the following year I started seeing um, some 4.9. I've, uh -huh. I've heard a few people talk about 5.1. Where do you get that from? Uh... I think data, yeah. I quit. I quit shopping from data when they sent um, my box full of honey squeeze bottles to an address I never lived at. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'll just order from somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lucky because in Polson, Montana, which is just an hour and a half north of us. Uh, Western B is Daydance wooden wear manufacturer, so they carry all their stuff. Mm. And I have a, you know, that's where we got all our stuff for the grant. Um, mm. So I've never had a problem with Western B. And if I was getting anything from Daydance, it came from them, and a lot of times we were just picking it up. And the people at Western B are great people. Um, so I still like Daydance for certain things, but. I'm not, I, I source, you know, like most bee, beekeepers, something from this company, something else from that company. Um, but the 5.1 was definitely necessary for trying to regress the 5.4 bees, since I, I didn't have. I buy everything from Man Lake, hint, hint. <laughs>
And they, do they have 4.9 wax foundation? Oh, yeah. They've, uh, they have 4.9 vertical wired now, too. Nice. In deep and medium. Nice. So I've started buying that mm-hmm. because when it works well, it saves a lot of time because you don't have to do oh, horizontal yeah. wires. When it doesn't work well, it goes into your frames kind of bowed. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so depends on the frame sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, and at this point, I also started trying to catch some swarms, but I didn't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I had some good ideas, but I wasn't really putting a lot of time into it. It was kind of just like, oh, I'll put a trap here, trap there. And actually, most of the swarms I caught were at my house in old 5.4 equipment that was just sitting outside. And I kind of set them up outside that they could be swarm traps, but also because I didn't have any storage space and I'm just a bad beekeeper letting my stuff rot outside. But Swarm yeah. traps, though, that's one, of, that's one of my rules in swarm trapping. Put all your swarm traps together and set them outside yeah. until you get them. Yeah. You will catch swarms at your house. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I have. And there's actually a video of a great big swarm moving into one of my stacks of boxes right next to my truck out in the dr- on the driveway. The, this last year I was interviewing John Kefis, who was one of my all-time gets for the podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, while I'm sitting there at my desk in the living room recording with him, a swarm comes into my trap and sitting right out on the back porch. <laughs> So I'm like talking to the person I've wanted to talk to for years, <laughs> and there's a swarm. And like, ah! <laughs> too much awesome happening at once. Yeah. Decisions. Yeah. So at that, at this point, you know, I had lost so many colonies um, that I decided until or this was about 2016. I decided until I have either A, better genetics, or B, small cell comb, I'm going to treat all the bees on large cell comb in order to keep honey in the bucket and money in my pocket. And so that's what I've done. But it took me about mm, three years, really. Three years of first year introducing 5.1, 4.9, and then, you know, weeding out, shuffling them. And I'm introducing them one or two at a time now. I stopped doing the whole box thing, um, except for a couple of them. And then then I broke down and bought, man, like, PF100s. And because I was sick of seeing wax foundation not drawn out properly. And... And then next year I bought Honey Supercell because they weren't drawing out the PF100s properly, usually. But by this past year, 2017, after two or three seasons, it's usually just two, um, I started seeing 4.9 comb drawn out correctly. You're starting to see it happen. And yeah, which you know, took a lot of money and time and dead bees. <laughs> was not probably the most um, smart business decision, <laughs> business decision I've ever made. But it was also a challenge for me. And I wanted to see if it was possible because, you know, there's no examples locally for me to go look at. Uh, and there's not really that many close treatment free beekeepers um, for me to even travel to go look at. So I just mostly was trying to do it for myself and also because I still believed in it. And um, so this 2017, the spring, I had a lot of 5.1, a lot of 4.9 and PF hundreds, one hive that was actually living on the honey super cell so I decided all right this year I should be able to get hives that are only on small cell comb weed out all the um, large cell comb 
And then if the hive had made it to only being on the small cell comb, 4.9 or lower, um, they weren't getting treated. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, because I don't know about the genetics, but I also felt like, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm going to draw the line. I'm not going to let bees on 5.4 or even 5.1 go untreated unless I n know that, you know, the genetics are strong enough to um, take care of the problems on their own, which I don't, I don't even know if that's possible. Uh, we, we, we don't need to go down that road. But so that was my protocol. You make it, you know, I'm like talking to the bees. If you guys, you girls make it to 4.9, then I'll stop treating you. And so I, at the end of the season, out of about 26 colonies that I made um, all out of splits, I had about, you know, 10 or 12 that I sorted out and put in their own yard and they're like this is my small cell yard you they're not getting treated this fall you know maybe they're all gonna die but I have I'm hopeful that they survive long enough that um, I can either keep raising more small cell bees out of there and get better genetics in um, before they all die or at least even if they do all die at least now I have small cell comb. Yeah, yeah, small cell. If I do catch a swarm, I can put them on small cell comb. I, I or any bees, you know, put them directly on the small cell comb, and um, and then now I can feel good about letting them die. One of my watershed moments in beekeeping, and I probably said this on the podcast a couple of times is when I bought small cell nukes. So I had mm -hmm. I had started out with small cell foundation. Yeah. And they didn't draw it out properly. They never do the first time around. Mm -hmm. But that's fine. Mm -hmm. It'll generally be smaller than it was than they were raised on. So it's it's an iterative process. Yeah. And that's what D Lesby was trying to force happen force to happen when she did the shakedowns. The problem with shakedowns is they're extremely stressful and it kills more hives than it's trying to save. <laughs> yeah. So we don't recommend that anymore. Yeah. Um, but where was I going with this? Your moment. Oh. Your epiphany. W so when I, when I got that small cell, I was able then to seed that perfectly drawn small cell into my hives and once they'd laid a few cycles of brood through that, mm -hmm. suddenly, with proper management, you're never going to draw it out properly in the in the supers. Honey supers, yeah. But by putting one or two frames of small cell foundation in at the beginning of the active season in the spring, they draw it out perfectly almost every time at that point, once yeah. they're on it. Yeah. So once you get that trigger, once you get that yeah. breaking the camel's back, whatever you, analogy you want to use. Yeah. From then on, it falls into place. And then you can do things like draw um, the PF frames in the supers, and it mm. will work. Yeah. But not until then. <laughs> yeah, right. They, you might think that it'd be difficult for them to pull a drone on plastic foundation. They can do it. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, yeah, that basically brings me to now, although I'm still not confident in my genetics because one, I haven't caught any feral swarms that I'm aware of, except maybe the one removal, but it's not small cell, but I could put it on small cell if it survives the winter. Um, but now my, you know, my goal is catch as many swarms as I can, All right? Hopefully I'll catch enough that I don't have to buy queens from anyone because I don't want to buy queens from someone because no one in my area is selling treatment free queens. But I do have a backup plan. If I don't catch any swarms, I still want, you know, I still want to make some kind of progress every year. I am going to buy some queens um, from as close to my area as I can. 
from people who are claiming to be selecting um, from survivor stock who are not treating their um, colonies they're raising queens from. And at least I can get, if I get those bees on small cell comb, at least maybe they'll live long enough to, um, that when I start expanding from those, they're mating with the, the feral population because, well, they're colored differently, they're smaller, supposedly, um, and they just have a, be a better position to start from genetically than a hive that, you know, a small cell hive that's been um, just given a commercial Italian queen that's never even given any sign of disease resistance. Well, listening to you talk about all these losses and failures and things, and I don't hesitate to use the word failure because I don't see that as a negative thing. This is one of the philosophies I've come to understand in life, and this is the part of this is part of the podcast where I connect beekeeping to life. I've started living by the philosophy that success has nothing to teach you after the age of thirty. <laughs> Failure will teach you a lesson quicker and more profoundly. Success cannot teach you anything. You don't yeah. change you don't change what's wrong if it's working. Yeah. Even if it's wrong, you're not gonna notice that it's wrong. You're gonna keep doing it because it's working. Mm -hmm. Failure gives you the opportunity. It, it 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 pounds it into your head, right? Yeah. So like this uh this last weekend I did a beginning beekeeping class and I accidentally forgot to turn the audio back on after the break. So the the people who were watching online for for a little bit before I realized it weren't getting audio. That was a huge failure to me personally. And that's something that I will never forget. Again. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to yeah. be double, triple checking everything to make sure everything, you know. Yeah. But had I, had I done it right, I wouldn't have that knowledge now. Yeah. And I would end up making that mistake at some point in the future. Yeah. So Definitely. you've, in what you've done, and I, I really respect your attitude toward doing this because, I mean, coming from a, I, I have a lot of, I don't know if sympathy is the right word or respect or, um, you know, the commercial beekeepers tend to put me down a bit, but I understand why things work the way they do. I understand why people aren't switching to small cell or, or treatment free wholesale, especially in the, the commercial realm. I understand mm -hmm. it's, you have to make your living. Yeah. You have to, you've got to provide for your family or, or your employees or whatever. It's yeah. just got to be done. Yeah. You don't have the time and money to play around with things that, well, to be, to be frank, might not work. No one's, well, no one's published like a how, this is how you do this. And I'm actually working on that because no yeah. one has it. I'm trying to write a book says, this is how you do this. I've seen it done by a bunch of people. This is how they mm -hmm. all did it. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do. Yeah. But even so, if I get all of that right, and it's all correct, and that's what works, it's still going to cost you some bees. And, you know, a commercial beekeeper can only handle so many losses in a year before it really starts cutting into next year's abilities, next year's, mm -hmm. op next year's yeah. down... Uh, yeah. Bottom line is the word I'm yeah. thinking of. So I understand. Um, and it's people like you who are willing to just be that guy that's just <laughs> pushing through the blizzard because yeah. he's going to get there. And, you know, I really respect that because I've. It's my beekeeping has never affected my bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, my losing hives doesn't cost me money. I'm not worried about trying to feed my family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a different situation. It's yeah. a different situation. I understand it 
But still, commercial beekeeping is is the you know I, I'm not going to be I'm not going to beat around the bush. Commercial beekeeping is what's wrong with beekeeping. <laughs> I the way we're doing commercial beekeeping, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I personally don't know if it's even possible to be a treatment-free beekeeper and take bees to almonds, for instance, because yeah. it's so far out of the realm of how natural, yeah, how the natural system works. I mean, even if you took your bees to a ginormous organic almond orchard, and they're not being exposed to a bunch of fungicides that are being sprayed while you're all pollinating. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, even if they're not get coming in contact with other bees from around the country, which they surely will, even if you're in a giant orchard mm -hmm. and you're the only one in there, your bees are still going to pick up viruses and other things from bees that are in the area. But I think, and that's, and that maybe that's the reason it might not be possible. But also the big thing is you, especially for someone like me, Maybe if it was someone in California, it wouldn't be a big deal. But someone like me who's trying to raise treatment for bees, so much of it is about being localized and mm -hmm. having local stock. Um, bees that are familiar with how they need to survive a winter or, you know, what plants they need to forage from. When you take them to California for the entire winter, well, now you've taken that selection pressure mm -hmm. off off the bees that you say you're trying to um, have locally adapted stock, but if they're not overwintering, how can you really say they're locally adapted? Oh, they do great in the summer. Well, yeah, any bees from any anywhere will do great in the summer because it's summer. Mm -hmm. But it's this minute you get cold weather, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you know, most commercial beekeepers who send their bees to California, they, they don't need to worry about where their bees come from because they're going to go to California for the winter. Mm -hmm. That's why so many beekeepers can run Kona Queens all over and up and down the country in Montana and Canada. Well, maybe not in Canada, but all over the north of the United States and still do fine because they don't have to overwinter they just ship them to california or wherever or some kind of climate controlled place um, it was always weird to me before there was varroa in hawaii that everybody was the the commercial beekeeper that i knew where i where i grew up and where i started was using kona queens and requeening everything once a year with kona queens mm -hmm. But Kona Queens had no resistance, zero resistance, because they had zero introduction to mites mm -hmm. at that point. And so you're, you're you're sacrificing production and queen availability in those, I mean, you're sacrificing disease resistance, which you're handling with treatment mm -hmm. by going for production and the ability to get a queen anytime you need mm -hmm. in great big numbers. Mm -hmm. But, so that's why when when people try to go from commercial bees to untreated, uh, they just don't have the tools. Well, you know, usually, it's like, yeah. It's like trying to teach a horse to drive a car. I mean, they can do the horn good, but <laughs> <laughs> the other stuff is not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that was my biggest flaw from the get-go but it was also like I really wanted to do something I had bees I was convinced I could breed out the bad genetics and just through open mating breed in the good genetics but I don't think it's really possible to do in the time frame you need to because the bees will die before you have enough good genetics to make that switch to make the change and, and maybe it has worked for other people but it didn't work for me and maybe because i wasn't doing any small cell or you know wasn't that doing small cell at that point when they're just not you know not going to make it so my recommendation for you would be 
First of all, I won't, don't want to cost you any more money. <laughs> You've already given enough. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it is my livelihood. And if I do have ex- extra money, I'm really bad about um, saving money. I end up just buying more equipment. Because I want you to be able to retire at some point. <laughs> I'm a very lucky individual, and that's maybe why I've been able to get away with all this that I've gotten away with. I have a supportive, loving family. Mm -hmm. I live in an area that has food growing everywhere, and I don't have competition with people, or stiff competition with other people for that food. Um, You can buy your equipment in bulk? I can buy my equipment in bulk. I, bulk prices, I mean. Yeah, I, I've got access to free equipment. Mm-hmm. I've got access to places to put my bees. I mean, I've got so many advantages over everyone, just any other regular situation. I'm really, you know, maybe I'm just making up for all the good luck I had by, you know, <laughs> sacrificing myself. For the greater good, because I, if all my bees died, if all my dad's bees died, and all my brother's bees died, and we lost the honey business entirely, I don't have kids. All my debt is my own. Like, I'm going to be okay. And, yeah, I'm going to be super depressed, for (laughs) sure. Maybe I might cry for a couple years, but... um, it's not like a life or death situation for me, or it's not like um, if I don't do something, I'm gonna lose everything I have. Um, even if I burnt up all my, I mean, most of my wealth is in my bees. Well, one thing we haven't talked about here that you can hear from your talk, which I will have posted by the time I post this, is you lost a bunch of bees to foul brood and had to burn a bunch of hives as well so this yeah. i mean if you're if you've been crying about about it before now i mean you <laughs> might as well just hang it up because i mean that's yeah. a that's a huge hit like that's this like the first the when i installed my first packages i had no experience with installing foundation in my frames and so a bunch of it fell out yeah. and so the first time i went to inspect my bees it was all a cross combed yeah. mess like I'm not ashamed to admit, I cried. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it's sad. It's sad. <laughs> it sucks. But failure is what will teach you all the yeah, lessons in life. Right. Success has nothing to yeah. teach you. And actually, I think the biggest thing for me now is, um, I feel really confident that I will be successful. Not because I'm such an amazing beekeeper. But because I know the bees I want are out there and they're existing and thriving on their own and I know how to catch them now. And even if it takes me 10 years to catch 10 swarms, you know, it's kind of like, you know, just knowing that whatever, you know, we try to do in our little lifetime or our little world and as much as we can try to mess things up, um, you know, life in the natural world usually just goes on, you know, yeah. Um, you can say there's competition and pain and all that stuff, but, you know, growing up in Montana, hunting and fishing and knowing that, you know, we have resources out there that haven't been completely depleted, I'm, I know I'm lucky because I know how to utilize those resources that I don't, I'm not reliant on a vehicle to make money for me or a job specifically, I mean, to make money for me to survive. If I lost all my money and I have to live like a bum on the land, I can do that. I know people that do that and live up in the woods, like totally. Actually, I've actually wanted to do that my whole life. I have wanted to try it. I don't know if. <laughs> I really like internet, <laughs> yeah. but so I'm, yeah. my project, one of my projects this year that, that comes under a number of different headings <clears throat> is I'm going to go up 
in the woods and go beelining for like a week this yeah. summer and find all these feral colonies of these bees that I've found in flowers. I'm going to find where the colonies are and get mm-hmm. to know my local bees mm-hmm. and maybe catch some swarms up there. Yeah. But let's get down to the intensely practical stuff. Let's make a list of if a commercial beekeeper wants to move toward treatment free, what they should definitely not do. And then let's talk about uh, what you definitely should do and where you can go in the future and hopefully make this because I really want this to work out for you. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're not my protege. You didn't get any of this for me. But this is like almost in a sense the holy grail. If we can turn the if we can turn the Titanic on the treatment free issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So things not to do as a commercial beekeeper. Um, if you've treated your bees for, uh, if you if you've treated prophylactically with antibiotics, definitely don't. Just try to take those hives and make them treatment free. You're going to have massive crashes with American Falbert. Po- very likely. Very likely. <laughs> I, in my experience, if it's not, yeah, eventually it's going to yeah. happen. So the boxes maybe, but the comb definitely don't. You, you might want to clean up the yeah. boxes. Maybe, get, maybe wax dip them or something to get them yeah. sterilized. And even. Even if you don't get foul brood, if you have been treating, um, and the combs are old, they're probably contaminated. Yeah. Don't try to take your Kona bees or your your California bees or Oliveras or mm-hmm. uh, Conan or whoever mm-hmm. your California, your Southern, your commercial bees that are done that are that are all been treated. Don't take those bees and Try to make them into treatment-free bees. It's not going to happen. It's <laughs> nope. just not going to work. You, you really want to start with... I mean, as a commercial beekeeper, you're buying queens by the thousands. Find a source that's going to be able to... You know... And you don't have to do the whole operation all at once. No. Take a side stream of your situation. You know, a couple of yards, a group of yards, or... A, a, a valley or whatever you're working with mm-hmm. and kind of start over there with a new batch you know if you want to make packages mm-hmm. out of your own bees or yeah um, something going that direction start a new side stream with that with new genetics and work work with those things with with new foundation small cell foundation that's however you want to do it don't yeah. try to take your treated commercial bees and make them into treatment-free commercial bees because you're going to have the same thing happen that, that happens all the time with with anybody who goes treatment-free without starting with good stuff is yeah. that just going to die. Yeah. Um, so, like, if for, in your case, for instance, I would, if you're going to buy queens, which, again, we're into the money issue, mm-hmm. um, go for something... I would recommend, uh, like, Michael Bush's stuff would be good, but it's going to be very expensive, to be honest. Uh, and, and I'm going to charge the same prices because that's what he's getting, so that's what I'm going to charge. <laughs> yeah, you got to <laughs> charge the standard rate. But something like maybe Zia Queen Bee with her Super Upers mm-hmm. from, from Upper Peninsula yeah. in Michigan, because they're going to be able to deal with the cold better. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe they're treatment free as far as I understand or at least their breeders are least supposed better. to be um, and start working with that that first year whatever survives start working with that and make queens out of that to uh, and I don't necessarily believe that requeening is always a good idea but your next generation of nukes you know if you're making splits mm-hmm. out of your hives that are already working Give them queens from the, the previous generation survivors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're building on that same population, that same family. Yeah. And hopefully, and then the next year, hopefully you'll lose fewer and you can do the same thing again. And yeah. once you get to the point where you have a sustainable population where you're lo- losing, you know, 5 to 20% or whatever, um, then you can start working with breeding for 
you know, taking taking that one ginormous hive, honey producer hive, that's gentle and you know it's the yeah. perfect hive, yeah. and then making a bunch of queens out of that, and requeening a few of the worst ones, and and using that to start your next generation of nukes. So yeah. you're always cycling it back into the same population. Yeah. What else should you definitely not do? Any any other major thing? Don't do shakedowns. Don't. I think that goes back to with the don't yeah. try to make don't try to take treated bees and turn them into not treated bees. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely uh, catch as many swarms as you can. Mm-hmm. Free bees are always good, even if you end up requeening them or do, doing something else with them later. Yeah, because if you're if you're doing if you're making a good swarm trap with a nice solid frame of small cell in there, they're going to be generally small cell from the beginning. Yeah. So my swarms, even though most of them come from conventional hives, I assume they still have an excellent winter survival rate because they're getting off on the right foot when mm-hmm. they start. Yeah. Uh, what else would be definitely not to do? I mean, don't, don't do pollination. Even, <laughs> regardless if it's almond pollination. Or, I mean, if it's local, fairly local, you're not moving bees around a lot. I just, it's on a crops, not good for the bees diet. And if it's a short period of time, and you know, it's a small scale thing. I mean, okay, but any kind of large scale pollination, I'd stay away from. Um, I just have to say right now I'm loving my uh, foam board lids Uh, even if you're not even if you're not using a nice telescoping cover on top of them Mm -hmm. maybe you you can paint them and make them last a few years longer but they're so cheap and they provide a good like lovely insulation I've been thinking a lot about making either thicker lids thicker plywood or two sheets of plywood to give a you know better insulative factor on top, but yeah, I'm considering just making them with some actual insulation. Right, the foam board <clears throat> to cut out ten lids out of a, a four by eight sheet. It's going to cost you three dollars a lid. Um, it's R10 insulating. You can find feed bags usually for free to do an inner cover, or mm-hmm. you can I, you might be able to laminate it or something with plastic, just so the the bees don't yeah. chew on it. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily have to use a telescoping cover. I just want to use one because I want to protect it from the yeah. sun. But they'll last several years without it, and if you paint it, they'll last even longer. Yeah. Um, you could make them bigger than the top, so they hang over, so they kind of provide mm-hmm. some some rain Mm -hmm. they don't add any weight to the top of the hive because they're really light cheap is good (laughs) what else was I going to say there's one more thing but yeah if you're if you're not migratory tops are good I've used migratory tops for years even though I just made my own Mm -hmm. but even though I wasn't migrating just because they were simple and I never understood I don't understand what the like today we were talking in the in the meeting what are inner covers for <laughs> like they add that little <laughs> bit of space on top so you have a full B space above the frame yeah but you put the lid on top they 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 rarely glue the lid down to the frames anyway they small yeah. small bees especially can still get through that space I feel like maybe because of the design of the telescoping inner cover they get when they're propolis and try to pull them off, they it puts too much strain on the structure. You break it, yeah. and you're breaking them. Whereas, you know, like a flat migratory cover, it it puts some strain on it, but they just pop right off once mm-hmm. you get it. It just pops off. I've never had like a hot a lid break because it's glued on with propolis with so much propolis that it, it broke unless the lid was already rotten. Otherwise, it just, it pops right off. And I don't know why that 
why it would be different for a telescope and cover. I'm just thinking it Maybe has to do with it. Maybe because it's so far up there you couldn't get a hive tool in the Yeah, that. that might be part of it. But the, the inner covers, or the telescoping covers that I have are the ones that I was given. I don't know where they came from. The first ones that I had that I was given because I've never bought any. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't have that inner layer of plywood on the on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. They've just they're just a wooden rim with a piece of sheet metal on top, folded mm-hmm. over and, and nailed to the sides. Yeah. So you really have to have some sort of inner yeah, cover. Yeah, you do. So basically, all I did was I would just take that and stick it on top of my migratory top. And so now with the foam boards, all I'm doing is taking the migratory top off, putting a foam board, and then putting the same thing back mm-hmm. on top of it. Yeah. And I can make those inner cover or, or telescoping covers for a couple of bucks a piece because it's just a, you know, like a one by two. Yeah. And then screwed together yeah. and a piece of flashing on it. But that, I don't know if that helped you or not. But. Well, the one consideration for me for overwintering in the style that I was taught by Bill is you set all the hives side by side so they're touching. For wind. Um, yeah, and they share heat and, and then back to back. So you can get, they don't touch back to back because in the migratory cover there's the cleat hanging over on the front and back. Right. Um, but side to side, they go right next to each other. Um, so they like share heat in the winter and it, it seems to be a really good method for overwintering. Yeah. So we've definitely got our quota in. <laughs> so, yeah. Is um, there anything else? I, I mean, I keep going back to what you were telling me last year. It's like, don't buy bees, catch swarms. And I feel like that's really where my success is going to come. Even if I do buy some good queens, even if I do get them on small cell and get them to survive and can make nooks out of them. I'm still going to get the bees I want faster if I catch more swarms. And see, for you, I would recommend doing a little queen rearing setup, like a, like a Ben Harden method or even just a regular, like a mm-hmm. cloak board yeah. or a, a, even just a queenless nuke to build you a bunch of mm-hmm. queen cells. Yeah. And then you make your nukes. You can split all of your healthy hives into however many four fried frame mm-hmm. nukes you want right at the time when you got all those ripe queen cells, cells coming yeah. out and you could at, at once turn you know just for example you could turn 10 into 25 or something yeah depending on how everything's yeah. doing but making your own queens for me making your own queens that's that's just that one thing that that all the people have done it successfully have done yeah and so that's why I keep trying to teach newbies how to make queens, yeah. even though everybody don't do that. That's that's advanced stuff. No, man. Yeah, making queens is everyone should where be it's raising at. their own queens. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that the queen industry is so large just speaks volumes about what kind of trouble we're in. Because if you look in the past, or even in other countries, you know they're probably not buying and selling as many queens because it's so easy to raise your own. I think a lot of Beginning beekeepers, especially, are scared off of raising your own queens for whatever reason. That you know, commercial beekeepers or treating beekeepers will tell you of all the things that are going to go wrong when you try to raise your own. But really, it, you aren't raising them. You're manipulating the bees to raise them, mm. and it's not that difficult. No, it's, not. <laughs> it's actually it's surprisingly easy. It's it's almost one of the easier parts of beekeeping. All you have to do is accidentally smash the queen, yeah. and then don't make more queens. Yeah. I mean, it's it's you can do it on work. accident just fine, and it'll work as long as you get in there and take yeah. the queen cells out and do stuff with them. The way that I yeah, the way that I was taught um, to make nooks and then let them raise their own, you basically don't have to do anything except make the nook, which you already have to do anyway, and at the first when I was first taught of how to do it, well, before they all hatch, you need to go in and cut a bunch of them so that you don't have too many um, virgins hatching and they were, are more likely to swarm. Hmm. And so I did that most of the years. And then, I think it's 2013 or 14, I started seeing a lot of black queen virus. 
And you know, I'm making four frame nooks. I have never seen that. Yeah, and who knows how, what kind of cycle that goes and comes in. But I decided, well, if I just leave two or three cells, and they all have black queen cell virus, because I can't see under the cell, you know, then I'm going to kill all, all the good ones and have only bad ones left. And if they're ha- half of them are going to die anyway, then why am I cutting half of them? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I cut half the queen cells and half of the nooks, and I didn't cut any in the other half. And I had the same take. And so I just stopped cutting cells. And I haven't had a problem with nooks swarming because there's too many virgins hatching. I've never had that problem. So basically what I do now is I make a nook and I come back five weeks later to check if it's laying. After I, you know, I make the nook, I move it to where I want them to hopefully breed with drones. And, it's, and those are all new queens. Yeah, if you're going to be selecting uh, a certain colony or a group of colonies that you want to breed from, um, yeah, definitely either make nooks out of those, but if you want a lot more queens than that, then do a queen rearing method because you really can make thousands of queens out of a couple yeah, hives. Out of um, even with the Ben Harden method where you're still maintaining production on your hive. You can, you can, I can pretty, pretty solidly make, I can almost guarantee 25 cells. Mm-hmm. And then if you're making your nukes right before those cells hatch and you're putting them directly into the nukes, you're saving the full week and a half it takes for them to raise another queen yeah. from, a, from an egg. Mm-hmm. They're saving you time. Yeah. Um, so it's just some idea. And you the, can select from the hive you want rather yeah. than just yeah. splitting That's all the of them thing. and each one of them. The one little thing you have to be careful about when doing that is not accidentally put a queen cell or a cup that started when you're making your nooks. If you're going to introduce a, um, a cell right away or soon after but that i mean that's also something that rarely happens you really shouldn't have to worry about and then oh so what a different virgin hatches it's not the one you picked how do you know she's not gonna be as good ultimately doesn't matter which is why we it's which is why we let them die we let them figure out which ones are the good ones yeah so yeah jake thanks for coming on the podcast I've, i've really been enjoying getting to know you on this yeah. trip uh it's been fun hanging out with you and um you know your your talk this afternoon was or this morning whatever it was this morning, was yeah. very enlightening i recommend if if any of you haven't seen that by the time you've listened to this podcast you really need to go check that out because uh, because jake's story is you want to cry <laughs> you really do <laughs> but <laughs> But it is it is important because it's it's innovators like him who are leading us. You know the commercial beekeepers aren't going to listen. They don't listen to me a whole lot. Um, yeah, they don't. Listen. And should they? I don't know. I don't necessarily can't make a case that they should <laughs> listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not a commercial beekeeper. I'm an educator for backyard beekeepers. But guys like Jake are the guys who are the next generation of guys that are actually doing it are going to be able to have that street cred to change the world. So, yeah, thanks. But thank you, because you're also providing the information that even the commercial beekeepers, beekeepers that are ignoring you aren't. The people who are carrying on still need the information wherever it comes from, mm-hmm. even if it's from someone, you know, who's not ever going to try to be a big commercial beach who's, who's so personably objectionable as me <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it that way <laughs> thanks yeah thank you it's been fun